Shabbat Shalom. Last time I spoke from up here on the Bima, I made a promise to you, and I intend to keep that promise. So you might remember that last time I was up here, I said, and whenever I speak, if there's ever a question you have, if you want me to expand, if you want me to clarify, if you want me to engage in some kind of question about what we're talking about, please raise your hand, and I promise if I can see you, that I will make sure to answer it, because I think that this is important. Are we okay with that? We good? Great, thank you. It's hard to tell a story when you already know the ending. It's hard to read a story when you know the ending. It's even harder to read that story when you know that the ending is tragic. This is something that I've been thinking about as week after week we've been reading about the construction of the Mishkan, the meticulous detail that the Israelites are putting into every single bit of construction with the finest gold, with the finest pieces of thread, that every single thing they're doing, they are bringing all they can with their full hearts, including in our Torah portion this week where it says that the Israelites' hearts are so full and so moved to be able to give to the construction of the Mishkan, they give and give and give until the point where Moses has to say, enough, we have too much. You've given more than enough. But this is a story that has some tragedy to it. Because we know that the construction of the Mishkan, this dwelling, let's remind ourselves what the Mishkan is. It is this physical structure where God has redeemed the Israelites from Egypt. God has made a promise with the Israelites at Sinai and has said, for a while I've been here watching you, helping you when I can, but now, ve'asuli mikdash ve'shachanti betocham. Build for me a holy place and I will dwell within you. No longer am I going to watch and observe. I'm coming with. I'm going to be there with you. So the Israelites are commanded to build the sacred structure, the structure that is quite literally and metaphysically going to house God, to house God's essence, God's dwelling place on the earth. And at Burma night this Thursday, we talked about this, and we talked about how this is really a traveling, a portable sanctuary for God, leading us to this next emanation of this physical manifestation of God's holy place in the world. And that next physical manifestation is the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. Wandering in the desert, we read that God's presence dwells within the Mishkan, and then when God wants to wander throughout the desert to lead the Israelites along the way, God's presence manifests itself as a cloud of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. And this wandering eventually culminates in us getting to Eretz Yisrael, it's getting to the Promised Land, and eventually getting to Yerushalayim, getting to Jerusalem, and building God's permanent home in the Beit HaMikdash, the Temple. Again, this is the same kind of structure as the Mishkan, layers of holiness, but going closer and closer to this level that philosophers and sociologists call an axis mundi. Quite literally, the place where heaven and earth touch. And we know that the temple is not an arbitrary location. According to the rabbis, the temple is exactly where Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac. And going even further back, the temple in Jerusalem is said that it is built on the original place of Gan Eden, of the Garden of Eden. Perhaps we can find no better place in Judaism for the idea of an axis mundi, a place where heaven and earth touch, than where creation started. But the part of the story that has some tragedy to it is that we know the story of the Jewish people is not just the, sto the story of Torah. The study of Torah is one of redemption, of Yetziat Mitzrayim, of exodus from Egypt, of arriving in the promised land and building God's sanctuary, God's structure on earth and finding a home for God. But the story of the Jewish people continues in the Tanakh, in the prophets and in the writings, 
and into rabbinic literature where we learn that God's sanctuary, God's holy dwelling, God's sacred place is destroyed. If God makes the decision to make God's presence manifest with us every single day to be present in the lives of the Israel and then it is ultimately destroyed, it leaves us with a very important question. What do we do after that? What do we do if God decides to make God's presence manifest in the world and then God's presence has no home anymore? Well, our rabbis had this very same question and they considered the Horban, the destruction of the second temple, to be the most devastating blow in the history of Judaism. But they also doubled down on our beliefs because they said, our God is not like any other God that could ever exist in the world. We do not believe in polytheism. We do not believe that God is just conjured up anywhere. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Listen, Israel, our God is one. And if our God is one and our God dwells with us, then in that destruction of the second temple, as we go into Galut, as we go into exile, the rabbis say, the Shekhinah, God's presence, goes into exile with us. The rabbis looked at the story that we have been telling, the story of the Mishkan, the story of the temple, and they made a very important distinction between our story and other stories. And they said, while it would be easy to close the book and to let this be a horrible, horrible ending, the rabbis decided that we continue to write our story. If God goes into exile with us, then God gives us a different idea of leadership. Once again, we are in Bamidbar. Once again, we are in the wilderness. And we are waiting for redemption. And the way that we've talked about this for years and years and for generations is that we continue to focus on, on this idea of the third temple, of that idea of rebuilding the temple and having this new construction where ultimate redemption will take place. But what I would like to suggest this morning is that we focus on something more present than just the third temple. We talk about the first Mishkan. We are back in the wilderness. Let's talk about the second Mishkan. Because right now, we are wandering, but God has not gone anywhere. God is here, and God is with us. But it forces us to ask a very important theological question, and one that might be really difficult for us to understand. So if in the original Mishkan, God was dwelling in this place, and God, when God was ready, would depart from the Mishkan and lead the Israelites along their journey, if God is in exile with us, the onus falls on us. God follows us where we go. And it is up to us if we invite God in. So the difficult theological statement, and it's hard to say from this bima, it's hard to say as a rabbi and hard to say in a sanctuary where we come closer to God. But we have to come to terms with this idea, this theology, that what we were always told growing up, that God is everywhere, is a statement that is nuanced. And I'll revise it in the way of saying God is not everywhere. God wants to be everywhere. And it's up to us to let God in where God wants to be. If we are this new idea of a Mishkan, then we have to understand that us as individuals and we as a community are capable of allowing heaven and earth to touch. But if we're capable of allowing heaven and earth to touch, that means that they, we have a great deal of responsibility that comes with that. And it's not easy. It's the furthest thing from easy. But we have a responsibility because our story continues to be written and our story is one of building, of building holiness, of building kindness, 
of building compassion, of building tzedakah, of building charity, of building redemption here on earth because we are partners in God's creation. I can think of probably no theological concept that could be more intimidating than the one I'm trying to say this morning. That each and every single one of you are a temple. And that with your lives, you are capable of allowing heaven and earth to touch. You are capable of, lo- of allowing God to be present where God has often been shut out. But one of the most difficult questions is how do we do this and we have to understand we're just people. How do we do this? But God understood that, and God understood that just as we are people with our flaws, with our insecurities, with our faults, with our falters, we still are capable of creating holiness. And if you can turn in your C-door with me, in your blue prayer book, to page 32, I saw this quote last night at the bottom of page 32 when Hazan was leading Mariv, and I thought it was just a beautiful way for us to look at this this morning. So please follow along with me in the English on the bottom of page 32. There's a passage that comes from one of my favorite philosophers, Martin Buber, and it says, you cannot find redemption until you see the flaws in your own soul and try to efface them. Nor can a people be redeemed until it sees the flaws in its soul and tries to efface them. But whether it be an individual or a people, whoever shuts out the realization of their flaws is shutting out redemption. We can be redeemed only to the extent to which we see ourselves. The world is in need of redemption, but the redemption must not be expected to happen as an act of sheer grace. Our task is to make the world worthy of redemption. Our faith and our works are preparations for ultimate redemption. So going to this idea of us being the second Mishkan, I want to go back to the idea of the first Mishkan and a great question that my friend Neil asked last week during Seyod Ashli Shit, which is the third Sabbath meal. And I also invite you, if you've never been to a Seyod Ashli Shit at Shari Sedek, please come. It is a great opportunity for us to get together, to pray, to eat, to learn, to sing, and to end Shabbat and welcome in a new week. So we invite you, please, you'd be very welcome. So last week, Neil asked this fantastic question and said, Rabbi, if the Mishkan is being constructed and when it's finally built, I'm paraphrasing Neil, so don't get mad if I mess up your question. If the Mishkan is finally built and it says that God's essence goes from place to place and the Israelites rest when God rests and travel when God travels, is there any set time for this or is this arbitrary? Do they leave every week? Do they leave once a year? Do they leave every day? And I think it's just a great question because I think it shows us exactly what we're supposed to be doing now. I think the answer to your question is, I think God left when God was ready, and God led the Israelites through the desert when God was ready. So when we're honest with ourselves today, I think we take that model, that with the responsibility of being a temple, of being an access mundi, of being a place where heaven and earth can touch as this community as, and as people who bring about God's presence through acts of compassion and through goodness, that we also have to be understanding with ourselves that this isn't easy and that holiness and this great responsibility that we have doesn't come just when we want it to. If we are in exile, then we need to rest when we need to rest and we need to lead when we're able to lead. As we go into Shabbat this week, I want us to think about that responsibility but not to look at it as this grand act of intimidation that we are responsible for holiness at every single moment and every single time of our lives, but rather to look at this as a time and a responsibility where once again, we will never ever let God depart from Israel. That God made a promise to us and we're making a promise back to God. The Shekhinah is in exile. God is in exile. 
We are in exile. Rest when you need to rest. But when you're ready, let heaven and earth touch and let God in. Shabbat Shalom.